Okay, let me do this the conventional way. <laughs> having some problems here with, uh, with our mic. Okay. I, I hope all of you can hear me. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. We can. Okay, great. I want to thank all of you for being here today. Uh, I think you're in for a very informative session. Uh, it's on a topic that for most of us is near and dear to us. It's one that uh, we should be aware of if we're not. Mm -hmm. Uh, within the system, within the CSU, they did research at all of the campuses and found that one in ten students are homeless. And so when you think about those statistics and you think about our own community, then this is something that should be on the radar that all of us should be aware of and something that we should cater to the needs of those who are in need. With Chris Ballard, he took this a step further. Uh, rather than just reading or researching, he wanted to live that life so that he would know firsthand what we're faced with and those who are in that situation, what they are facing on a daily, I would say daily, but daily and nightly mm -hmm. as well basis. And so today, I think you'll hear some things that for all of us will be informative as well as enlightening to us as we approach this on our own campus. Uh, the Housing and Food Security uh, Committee thought that this would be a wonderful thing to do. I do want to recognize those members of the Housing and Food Security Committee for our campus. If you are here, please uh, please stand and let us recognize you. Okay, Chris, I hope you can shout as loud as I'm shouting. <laughs> well, folks, uh, thank you for, for being here. I'm, I'm very excited about the turnout. I'm actually, I feel really good. So. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about something I did uh, many, many years ago uh, when I was young and good looking like Jorge is. Uh, <laughs> I, I went homeless, right? And then I did it voluntarily. So we're going to talk about that experience uh, and sort of dive in. So today's presentation is going to cover sort of some background as to who I am, sort of my background, what it was like for me growing up. From there, I sort of sh shift gears into sort of why I decided to go homeless, what I did to prepare for that, uh, the steps I took, uh, the sort of process leading up to going homeless. And then I'll talk to you about the experience, right? What it was like when I got there, what did I experience, uh, what were the feelings, the environment. Uh, and then from there, I'll give a few takeaways and then uh, I'll finish up uh, with a few questions from folks. So please keep in mind any questions you have, I love to take them towards the end. So, who am I? <laughs> uh, I am a local uh, boy. Well, I'm a man now, but uh, <laughs> I am a local. I'm from Wasco, California. Uh, and what's interesting about me is that I grew up very poor, right? So like a lot of our students uh, at CSUB, I'm actually first generation. My parents are actually a high school dropout. So with me, I grew up uh, on welfare, food stamps, uh, you name it. I sort of was a part of that but I had never been homeless, right? So there are degrees of poverty, but I had never been homeless before. Uh, I was fortunate enough to go off to college, get educated. When I graduated, I became a community organizer. So uh, an organizer is someone who sort of goes into neighborhoods that have issues, and an organizer tries to empower residents within neighborhoods to fix issues in those neighborhoods. And when I became an organizer, it was a subprime lending crisis. Uh, and keep that in mind. But I'm going to tell you about why I sort of became an organizer and why I went homeless. So when I was in college, uh, I loved, can, fo can folks hear me? What about now? Is that better? OK. I like this mic. Uh, <laughs> so when I was in college, social justice titans uh, mesmerized me, right? 
uh, you know, all these quotes float around in my head. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Uh, he who is greatest amongst you shall be your servant. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, right? These are all quotes uh, that sort of galvanized me as a young man uh, when I was sort of becoming uh, educated and, and entering into my professional life. Uh, so when I became an organizer, I wanted to change the world, right? And a part of me was, in a sense, young and naive. Uh, but I think within that uh, is a lot of positivity uh, and, and sort of being naive about changing the world. But I took that uh, in the work I did uh, as an organizer. So uh, the year was 2008, 2009. Uh, we were in an economic recession in the United States. And we were at the height of the subprime lending crisis, right? So the notion of subprime, uh, subprime loans mean that individuals who have sort of low uh, credit scores were able to get homes and able to, to buy affordable homes, but they were given uh, subprime adjustable rates. So uh, if you see the chart in the early 2000s, uh, the red line indicates that home ownership was going up. Right, so the early 2000s leading up to 2008, uh, folks were buying homes. And some folks were buying homes who didn't have the proper credit scores to buy homes, but they still were able to buy them. Sadly, during 2007, 2008, 2009, there's a dip because we hit the economic recession. And with that, a lot of folks who were able to buy homes, those adjustable rate mortgages, they adjusted. Not for better, but for worse. So all of a sudden, you had a lot of uh, uh, good people who may have been low income, may have been middle class, who were a paycheck away from being homeless, were now homeless, uh, uh, trying to find ways to survive. And a lot of those folks were folks who I worked with on a day to day basis when I was a community organizer. So I went from trying to help someone, you know, uh, get better teachers in their schools to trying to help someone save their home from being homeless, right? And within that experience, we did a lot of good work in Kern County. Uh, we brought uh, banks to the table with residents to try to get them to change their, their mortgage rates, but some banks would not bail out. They would not switch up. So I had to figure out, you know, I, I don't know what this experience is like for these folks, so how do I embody that experience so I can be of better service to folks who are now homeless? So what do you do when you're young uh, and idealistic? You go homeless. And uh, I slept on the streets of San Francisco. Uh, I slept in a homeless shelter called St. Vincent de Paul Homeless Shelter. Uh, for my job, <laughs> I took a vacation. Um, and here's one thing I regret. I'll go through those. But one thing I regret is uh, when I told my mom what I was doing, right? Uh, so I grew up very poor. And the notion that I went to school and made it and, and came back, I was sort of the trailblazer for the family, right? Lifting the family up out of poverty. And then all of a sudden I come home and I tell my mom, I think I'm gonna go homeless. That's not something your mom wants to hear, you know? <laughs> um, and then also, I told her the day before I was doing it. I don't recommend, I do not recommend that. That's a lesson learned. But what I do, I panhandled, I, I made cardboard signs, I begged for money, I begged for food, I studied homeless individuals in the sense that I followed them day in and day out, I watched their activities, I wrote things down, um, and I did a little study, which I'll get into a little later, and I tried to embody the experience. Also some facts, uh, my name is still in the system for St. Vincent de Paul down in San Francisco. Um, Watch the man eat a sandwich in slow motion. Uh, that means even in the shelter I was in, you see the remnants of trauma, you see the remnants of, of uh, drug abuse and addiction, uh, full force, uh, set next to a child. This is in the same, this in the Paul Holman shelter, right? Children by themselves. These are sort of memories that hit me when I think back to what I did. So how did I do it? Um, I just took 
the bare necessities. I really wanted to, to live the experience, so I didn't have a cell phone, I didn't take any money. Uh, I took a journal to write with. Uh, I had a backpack with a blanket inside. I went to the Salvation Army. I bought a hoodie with some sweatpants. Uh, I had a little beard. You know, I tried to sort of look at the part in a sense. And I bought a round trip uh, train ticket. Um, in terms of food, I figured uh, I would go to the shelters or I would beg and I hoped I would get some money so I could maybe buy some food. So that was the idea, right? I wanted to make sure that there was sort of insecurity in this approach, right? So that way it would make me do things to survive, which makes it more realistic. So what happened when I got there? Uh, it was different. Uh, for starters, it was immediate chaos in the sense that there is no more security. Um, so when I first arrived, uh, the first thought was to find the shelter, right? So I found the shelter, uh, and here's a picture. The very bottom left, this is the shelter I stayed in, St. Vincent de Paul, homeless shelter. Uh, and from there, okay, I knew what time I had to go there if I wanted to sleep for the night. So I, I, I sort of took mental notes in terms of what I needed to do. From there, I figured maybe I'll try to make a little bit of money, right? So I go to an alleyway. I've got a marker in my backpack. I see some cardboard. So I grab a piece of cardboard and I write, please help, because I'm gonna go panhandle. And then I'm thinking, you know, this alleyway is kind of resourceful. Maybe I'll sleep here at night, right? And as, <laughs> and as I'm walking out the alley, Behind the trash can, I see a creature uh, slowly moving, right? And I say, that's a strange looking cat there. And I get a close look, that's not a cat, that's a rat, right? Uh, pretty big rat, right? And I don't know if you've been in a big city, you ever see those rats? You know, I looked at that rat, that rat looked like it said, what's up to me? <laughs> you know, these are, this is, this is different. Um, <laughs> So I said, I'm gonna to try to find somewhere else to stay. Um, but from there, I panhandled, and uh, I went, uh, let me give you an idea of where I was. So uh, in terms of San Francisco, uh, the homeless shelter is located sort of south of Market uh, in San Francisco, and that's a little bit under a mile from the financial district. So, uh, and the financial district is also uh, within a mile of Tenderloin, right? So this is where I sleep, but this is where I sort of spent most of my days, sort of walking through the financial district where there was a good amount of wealth, but also extreme levels of poverty and addiction. Then also walking through the Tenderloin, which is very similar to uh, Skid Row. Who, who's familiar with Skid Row here? Yeah, so very familiar with Skid Row in the sense that, uh, you, you know, you walk down the street and it's normal to see someone passed out on the street, right? And also, you walk down the street, on Market Street, and, and you'll see people with needles uh, doing drug uh, uh, inducements, right? That's stuff you don't see here in, in, in Bakersfield, but that was sort of, I don't want to say the norm, but that was activity uh, in San Francisco. So when I panhandled, that was probably one of the lowest moments of my life, to panhandle. And I'll tell you why. Because we often see these photos of individuals giving, but in reality, it's actually these photos of individuals with the means to help just walking by. And that was my experience. Uh, multiple days uh, on Market Street and Soma uh, and the Tenderloin, uh, asking people for help. Right, asking for assistance, and people just walk by. And within that framework, there's a certain level of inhumanity that should be against the law, right? And for me, it wasn't about the actual money. And, and, and I think that's true for all folks who are, are homeless. It's not about the money, it's about the absence of human recognition, right? 
So, and, and I'll get into that a little bit later in terms of takeaways, but that's something that really hit home for me. Also, racial politics, panhandling. So I studied uh, two individuals, because for starters, I was tired of people telling me no, and I give me money, so I figured, okay, let me study this. Uh, I'm gonna study a Caucasian male and follow him all day and night and watch him panhandle and track how many people give him money. And then I said, okay, I gotta do a compare and contrast. So I'll pick an African-American male and do the same thing. So if you, if you were a fly on the wall, you would have seen a homeless man walking down the street and Chris is slowly, you know, throwing <laughs> things down. Uh, but the results, are, the, result, the results are, are sort of what I, I expected but didn't expect. Um, the individual who was Caucasian received 10 times more uh, donations than an individual who was African American, and there was no dis, dis, disruption in the means in which they panhandled, right? They both just had a cup and asked for money. Uh, and I thought that was interesting. Uh, so, you know, the racial politics aspect is something I didn't expect. And I think uh, at that point, you know, I was kind of uh, broken down a little bit by the experience. You know, you get worn down after a while. Uh, and, and I wanted to sort of uh, get a little bit of freedom. So uh, within that, when I was in the shelter one day, a group of law students uh, were walking throughout the shelter, right? They looked like they were just 15 years old, so young, and they had clipboards. And their job was to go in the shelter and to ask people questions like, how did you become homeless? Uh, what resources do you need? How can we help you? And so I, you know, I was tired. I figured I'd have some fun. So uh, a young girl comes up to me and she sits down. She says, hello, sir. Uh, how can I help you? And I said, come here. I said, come closer. And I said, uh, I just robbed a bank in Kansas City. They're trying to lay low. <laughs> the look on her face, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, she looks so confused. Uh, uh, so after some silence and awkwardness, uh, she said, I'm gonna, let me get my supervisor. And I said, wait, let's not do that. This, this is a joke, this is what I'm doing. Uh, <laughs> but that's sort of uh, what I did to sort of, you know, try to find some comedy to miss the despair that I was in, right? Because you, I think in terms of trying to find sanity, humor is often uh, a remedy for pain and struggle. All right. So uh, shortly thereafter, I decided to, to head back home. And uh, I journaled about the experience. And I wrote in, in a couple of articles, uh, did a couple of presentations about the experience. and. Uh, and thinking about takeaways, uh, the, the whole notion of being homeless has a lot of different points. Um, a couple weeks ago, I was watching Hell Week. Uh, anyone familiar with Hell Week? So folks in the military, uh, there's a week where they go through a sort of extreme uh, training, uh, extreme fatigue, uh, and the Discovery Channel sort of videotapes this Hell Week, right? And I was watching one individual who was extremely fatigued, he had just finished doing bear, crawl, bear crawls, and he looked like he was about to faint, right? And then someone walks up to him, a reporter, and asks him, are you ready to give up? And he says, no, I am living the dream. So when I heard that, I thought about my experience, and I thought uh, <coughs> that a lot of the struggle that individuals go through can be mental, right? So your, your physical circumstances do not dictate uh, how you feel. Even in the lowest of lows, uh, there can be freedom and happiness or living the dream. And what's funny is that when I was homeless, I met a lot of people who were happy, right? Because there is freedom in this absence of dealing with human obligations, right? There's freedom in being around a community of like-minded people who will not judge you, who uh, will treat you the same way they want to be treated. And to me, that was fascinating. That's something I did not expect, um, but it still resonated with me. Also, mental illness and addiction is rampant uh, when it comes to dealing with homelessness, right? And I think that's sort of 
where there's a disconnect between the resources that are available to folks and whether or not there's a bridge to getting those people to those resources. Um, so in terms of the, the, the main takeaways from this experience overall, uh, I think the point is sort of just to treat people with dignity and respect uh, regardless of their circumstances. And I think dignity and respect means human acknowledgement uh, more so than it means giving someone a dollar or two, right? In addition, uh, in terms of the life of our students, um, you know, the definition of homelessness is any individual who lacks a fixed, regular, or adequate nighttime residence. So uh, this can mean uh, folks, families sharing uh, homes, uh, couch surfing, uh, living in shelters, and even living in cars. So when you look at our student population, we have a large portion of students uh, who are first generation, who uh, have a lack of support at home. Uh, they are the first in their families to make it to college, and they are the first to sort of lift their families up from poverty. Now, even though that's inspirational, within that is constant struggle, because they don't have individuals who can give them support they don't have parents who can save them when the money runs low. All they have is themselves. So my message, uh, for those of us who are not homeless and those of us who have the means to help, uh, we should do all we can just to show basic human recognition of folks in the struggle. That goes a lot further than it does in giving someone a dollar or two. And for the students who are currently homeless or are at risk, uh, <laughs> Like Hell Week, I think it's all mental, right? Uh, for students who are struggling or at risk, uh, your current struggle, in essence, is just a stepping stone for your future success. And I know that, because I've been there. And that's, the, that's pretty much it. So uh, thank you folks for coming. <laughs> So, so with that, I will open it up to questions. So why did you choose San Francisco? Mm -hmm. Good question, good question. So the, the, so the, the notion was uh, either Los Angeles or San Francisco, right? And to be honest, uh, I heard about Skid Row, I had driven through it, and I just didn't want to do it, right? I think there was some fear there, right? And then my mom also, right? My mom, <laughs> she's like, where are you going, Chris? Skid Row or, or San Francisco, you know, she's seen Skid Row before, right? That's, that's almost an elevated level of homelessness and, and struggle that's so entrenched in that community, right? Um, and I didn't think at the time that was something that I could handle, right? As opposed to San Francisco, which I knew had a host of resources. So when I got there, there would be struggle, but there would be options for support. Does that make sense? Yeah. Can you tell us about how the officials of San Francisco treated you? Not just the regular people walking by, but I'm talking like police and people like that. Yeah, so the police, uh, you know, it's, it's sad, and I'm glad you asked that question. So the police treated me just like the folks on Wall Street, uh, ignored me unless I appeared to be loitering or hanging around a business, right? Uh, and it's sad because I even, I even changed the way I spoke, right? just to analyze how I would be treated, right? And speaking with police officers and speaking as a panhandler, uh, from using slang to speaking very proper, right? And it, and it all boiled down to the fact to how I was dressed and the fact that I was, I appeared to be homeless. It doesn't matter how well you speak, it doesn't matter if you got degrees, if you look the part, we're gonna treat you the part. And that's how everyone treated me down the line. Except, except one person. Uh, on the train ride back, uh, I was on the train and I, you know, I still looked pretty bad and you know, I had uh, the beard and I was kind of dirty and stuff. And a little girl uh, sat next to me on the train and she asked me, can I draw your picture, right? So, uh, she's, uh, I, first of all, I was like, first of all, Where's her parents at, right? Because I'm, you know, you see me, this is not okay. You know, her parents are on your way. Uh, but her parents are right next to She says, okay. So she draws a photo of me, and she gives it to me. And I say, wow, this is nice. 
Then she looks at me and she says, no, it is beautiful, mm. right? Aww. The eyes of a child, mm -hmm. right? If we treated everyone with the dignity and respect that we teach our children to give people, the world will be a different place. Mm -hmm. right? Yes? So in the first slide, you talked about chaos and sight, which is how I would imagine you know, coming into that type of environment. And then later on, you talked about then finding community. How did you navigate that? Wow, that's, a, that's a good question. You know, I, I think the chaos was, I hate to say this, but <laughs> the chaos is what sort of strengthens the community. As weird as that sounds, right? The chaos uh, sort of binds these <coughs> folks together. You know, when I was in the shelter, there was constant fights, and there would be fights that were very petty, right? If I walk, if I walk by you and then I, and I brush you briefly, then that's a fight, right? If if someone is passing out food in the shelter and I ask you, are you going to eat that? That can be a fight, right? So you know you're dealing with extreme levels of agitation, um, but at the same time, it's a shared experience that no one else, not only is dealing with, but no one else seems to care about from that sense, right? So the chaos, in a sense, sort of uh, bridged, or sort of built the community. So yeah, that's, that's how I would answer that question. Yeah. Yes. Chris, you talked about um, that one of the worst parts was the absence of human interaction. What do you recommend to all of us when we see homeless people? Wow, you know what I would say? Uh, that's a, that's a good question. I don't want I don't want to say don't give people uh, money or, or food. I don't want to say that because I think I think that's helpful, right? I think you know people need means to survive and, and to live. But this is the United States, right? We have a, a, a social safety net in place where people can get the, the means they need to survive. People don't starve in the United States, right? Uh, so from that viewpoint, I would say. Uh, just simple acknowledgement of someone, right? I think that goes a long way, right? There's a South African word, I'm, I wanna make sure I get this correct, it's called Mbutu, which means uh, I am because you are, which means I see you because you see me, right? Simple acknowledgement goes a lot further than a few dollars, right? So that's what I would encourage. Right? If you're walking down the street, you see someone struggling, a simple hello, right? But all within means of safety, right? I mean, you know, be safe, but, you know, a simple hello, simple human recognition goes a long way. Overall, how long was your experience that you remained with? It was a week. A week. Yeah, I was going to do two weeks, but then I said no. <laughs> And, then, and, and I had the option, right? I have the option. Some people don't have the option. Mm -hmm. Chris, um, <clears throat> if you were to conduct this research again, um, is there anything that you would change about it or do anything differently for people that want to experience the research that you went through? Wow, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, I, this time I would bring a camera or a photo, just, or, or yeah, a camera on my phone to document things better so I can show you actual photos of what things look like, you know? Show you what that rat looked like. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think, I think that's what I would have done differently. Document the experience visually so folks can actually see it uh, more realistic. But yeah, that, I think that's what I would do differently. Yeah. Yes? How did this experience change like, the course of your life after the week? That's, that's a good question. <laughs> I'll tell you what. <laughs> so, uh, so remember the student, the, the law student I told her I robbed the bank. You remember that student? I end up going to law school the next year, right? And guess what law school I go to? Her law school. Right? <laughs> and then I see her walking to class one day. <laughs> and she's like, wait. <laughs> right? So then I tell her, you know, I just told her what I did and I applied to law school. 
Um, but yeah, so I went to law school. Um, I wrote about the experience. Uh, and, and if anything, I, I just, I think it sort of uh, strengthened my ability to, to care for people who didn't look like me or come from where I come from. Uh, I think it made me uh, broaden my world views in terms of human struggle and the roots of human struggle um, and the causes. Um, yeah, and I think it made me a, a better person. I think so. And what's funny is that I, I shared this message uh, when I went to law school. In uh, this photo, uh, do folks know who this, fo this fella is up top? That's Willie, Willie Mays, he's a legendary San Francisco baseball player. So Willie Mays uh, has a foundation called the Say Hey Foundation. And they give scholarships out, right? So you know, I wrote to Willie Mays and said, Willie, why well, didn't say Willie? I said, Mr. Mays. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, applying to law school, you know. I was in San Francisco for a while, some things I did, and he read my story. Uh, and Willie Mays brought me out to, to uh, to a baseball game in his box. So this is a San Francisco Giants baseball game. So this is Willie Mays right here. This is his lawyer, uh, uh, Malcolm. Uh, this is a good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Zitrin. And there I am. And uh, so I'm talking to uh, Willie Mays about this experience. And, and Willie Mays, uh, you know, I'm asking him about struggle he dealt with, right? And he's giving me inspiration. And then at one point he says, Chris, uh, I'm going to give you a scholarship. Tell me with your law school, right? So Willie Mays, <laughs> uh, he pulls out a check for $30,000, right? So that's another takeaway uh, that was really helpful, you know? <laughs> um, but yeah, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't change a thing. But yeah, that's, that's uh, it's been a big part of my life. Dr. Wallace. Chris, I'm sure before doing this, there were things that you expected. What experiences did you have that you did not expect? Yeah. I did not expect to see children in a shelter with me uh, who were abandoned. My first night uh, in the shelter, when you get to a shelter, you gotta get there early. I don't know if anyone's seen the movie, The Pursuit of Happiness with Will Smith. There's scenes, those scenes are very realistic where you have to get to a shelter early to get a bed. So after hours of waiting in line, I finally get inside the shelter to sit and then do more waiting to get a bed. And as I'm sitting down, it's about 10.30 at night. And I look across from me, and there's a little black boy, about 10 years old, and, uh, or could you go? Could you go back, right here? Go back. Yes. And he, he was sitting in a chair, just like this. This is why I put this photo here, just like this. And he had his shirt actually uh, covering his face. And the little kid, he was crying. Right? He was crying. And to me, I didn't understand how that could be. How could, at least in our American system, this child be here? by himself, and it's almost as if it's not a problem, right? That, and that's something that, that's, that's a part of the trauma that I still have from the experience, seeing that little, that little boy crying. Um, so that's something I definitely did not expect. It's one thing to be a man or a woman and to go through struggle, but to be a child by yourself, that's another story. Chris, in, in the short time that you were um, there, were you able to develop any start of a personal relationship with anybody you interacted with? Yes, yes. Uh, so when I was homeless, um, first couple of nights, so when you, when you do the shelter life, it's a lot of waiting and sitting around with folks to get beds. And when I was there, uh, I sat by a fella who was a Vietnam veteran. And I write about this, and he's very fascinating uh, because um, if you looked at his arms, he had, uh, his left arm was covered with track marks, right? So when you, when you use drugs, you get these track marks in your arms. 
Then his right arm was covered with army uh, uh, signia, right? So he was a Marine, he had the logo on his arm, you know, history of, of combat that he was proud of. And what's funny is that as I sat next to him and I would talk to him, you know, he'd tell me about his life and things like that. But whenever he would talk about things that were sad to him, he would always use his right arm to cover up his left arm. Which in a sense, his, his pride that he had here with his army insignia will cover up his shame in a sense, right? Uh, and I thought that was fascinating. So he, he was a good friend of mine. Uh, he told me, you know, uh, how to panhandle, what works, what doesn't work, what time to get to the shelter to make sure you get a bed, right? So, uh, but Sally, you know, we, we don't, I don't have any contact information, but at the time, he was a, a resource for me. Yeah. Were you able enough? Were you able to make enough <coughs> money panhandling to feed yourself? Or? You know what? That was that was a struggle. That was that was a struggle. And at a point, you just want to give up. And, and to be honest with you, at these very low levels of any humanity, it becomes almost rational to want to steal. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Even after just a week. Yes. Even even after just a week. It becomes a rational process. Okay, you don't want to help me, I'm human. You don't want to treat me like I'm human, so I'm gonna treat you like you're not human. I'm gonna take what I want, right? And, and within that mindset, you see how sort of societies collapse slowly, right? But yeah, that, that was a, an experience, yeah. Yes? Um, how can we help our students who are homeless? How can we best help them? Wow, that's a good question. Uh, you know what? I think it, so our, our students are, are sort of going through different levels of homelessness, right? Whether it's couch surfing, whether it's living in a car. Um, you know, I wish we could provide housing for all of our students, but we just don't have the resources to do that. Um, but I think the best thing we can do is just make sure we give them all the resources that they have in sort of a one-shop stop place so they know, here are my options, right? And I think that goes a long way. To know that you've got options is helpful, right? Yeah. And then also just to remind students that, you know, you're at CSUB for a reason, right? That's because you're gonna leave this place better when you leave than when you started, right? And all your dreams and aspirations will be met, and the current struggle you are in will be a distant memory when you leave, right? So making sure we give them the resources they need, but also giving them the inspiration and motivation they deserve to keep uh, moving along. Yes. While you were out there, did you ever go into dumpsters for food? And mm -hmm. the second question, how did your mother really feel? Yeah, so I answer the first one. So I love my mom. <laughs> I love my mom. Uh, so she, I think she was, she, I think she was confused, right? You think about it, you grow up very, very poor, right? You've been through it all, but you've always had a house, right? My mom, she struggled just to maintain shelter for us. And all of a sudden, a, a kid who has made it in a sense is saying he wants to voluntarily go seek no shelter, right? That's, a, that's an odd, odd thing to do. Um, but I think she still loves me. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, <laughs> I know she does. Um, but no, uh, dumpsters, no, right? I, so when I observed folks who were homeless, who were eating out of dumpsters, uh, there, there seemed to be uh, mental uh, uh, illness associated with that behavior uh, more times than not, just from my observations. I can't say that's for sure, but that's sort of what I observed. But no, I didn't. You know, when it came to sort of uh, hazardous things, I tried to stay away from those in terms of uh, eating out of dumpster. And then also, I didn't have to, right? You know, we have a safety net in place. The homeless shelter gave me food. Uh, some people gave me money, not a lot. Churches would do these sort of food drives and, and give out hot plates. So, you know, I had a good amount of, of resources to get food. Um, so people, uh, people help, society helps these uh, communities. Were you able from that side, from the inside, to see any efforts 
from outside come in <coughs> and change uh, people's lives that were effective? Were you able to see maybe people leave the, the shelter? And in other words, what worked from the outside, or what? Wow, that's a good. You know what? <coughs> I, this is this may strange, sound strange, but uh, nothing, mm. nothing. <coughs> but, but that's. That's a, that's a strange answer, but in a sense, when I looked at the shelter, when I looked at society's treatment towards me, keep in mind, I only did this for a week, so take this with a grain of salt, right? This is not fact. Um, it was almost as if society had put these mechanisms in place just to keep me there, as opposed to lifting me up out. Does that make sense? And that's kind of how I felt, right? You, you, you have a shelter just, just to give you the basic means to, to survive. We're gonna make sure we give you some food to eat to make sure you can eat. We're gonna give you water and a place to stay. And that's pretty much it, right? So yeah, I think that was an uh, 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 issue for me. And in a sense, you know, at one point in the shelter when I was eating, I felt like I was almost in prison which is strange, but everything was sort of structured in a way where this is what you do, this is how you do it. Uh, there will be no changes here, go about your day. So that was, that was kind of a strange experience, but for the most part, everything was sort of there to sort of keep me living at the most basic level with no uh, support in terms of upward mobility. But that's only seven days, right? There are a lot of good organizations in San Francisco and in California who help lift people up out of poverty, who provide housing to folks, who provide vouchers. Uh, but in my experience, uh, within the seven days, I just didn't see that. Marcus. You have one facility. Um, two questions. Were you able to research any others or did you encounter any other? Uh, homeless shelters that you went to, and of the one that you spent the most time, um, was it was it run organized well in your sense? Was it operated well? Um, so I only chose one shelter, which is St. Vincent de Paul, and I figured that's where I would I would just be at because um, I only had a week, so I wanted to do a lot more than just sort of search around shelters. In terms of how it was run. Uh, very mechanical in a sense where there's a lot of structure. This is the time they open the doors. Uh, this is the time they close the doors. We don't care what your situation is. Uh, the doors are closed. This is the time we eat. I don't care if you're hungry. If you're not here at this time, you don't get fed, right? So within that, we have uh, a structure of support, but the support is, is capped off. Right? In a sense, that's good because you want to put responsibility on individuals, but uh, how do you do that to someone who has uh, a mental disability or someone who has been through uh, a life, a long, who has a lifelong history of trauma, right? I think from that perspective, uh, there was a lack of flexibility in terms of the way homeless shelters are run, uh, and I think that did more harm than it did good. Any other questions? All right, well folks, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, let us all go out and change the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs>